Thanks, Kathy. Thank I, I'm a huge fan of U4FC, and uh, whenever I get an invitation from them, I can't say no because I really believe in in what uh, U4FC does and has done, and I've seen it evolve and into a. Uh, all, it was all great to begin with, but even more magnificent now. I, I, uh, you know, this room is really kind of strange to me because I'm not sure when it, the last time I was in here, but I can tell you the first time I was in here. Because I was a freshman at Cal uh, the fall semester of 1967 when I took Psychology 1 in, in this room. I was a psychology major. Um, also, those of you who are hanging out right now, I really wonder what's wrong with you. You know, when I, when I, I, I'm, I'm never at the last session, okay, when I go to conferences, so my hat is off to you. You know, I, uh, is there going to be immigration reform this year or this term? Uh, and honestly, it's, it's anybody's guess. Anything could happen. And, um, and as the title suggests, it really only can happen if a lot of people participate and make their voices heard. Uh, one reason why it may be a good idea to have me talk on this session is because I'm old. And so I was around uh, when the, uh, in 1979 when, when President Carter formed a, a, a policy commission on immigration. It came out with a bunch of proposals uh, and, uh, and they, they basically uh, embodied what the 1986 IRCA provision was, which was the so-called last um, amnesty provision. But you should know that the, that, that bill, IRCA, the main part of that bill was bad. The main part of that bill was, the, uh, was employer sanctions. First time in the history of the United States, in federal laws anyway, that it became unlawful for an employer to hire an undocumented worker. So prior to 1986, it didn't matter if employers hired undocumented workers. And that was the main part of the bill. The, the legalization provision that had two parts to it, a five-year residence one part and, a, and a, uh, an agricultural part, uh, three, three million people ultimately were legalized under that provision, but that, that barely passed. There was a swing vote of 15 people in the House of Representatives uh, that enabled that uh, legalization provision to become part of the law. Uh, otherwise, the main part, of the, the main IRCA was employer sanctions. Uh, but, you know, so I and other people give Reagan a lot of credit for signing that bill and sort of pushing for it. Um, and Reagan never really spoke eloquently about undocumented individuals in the United States, but his council of economic advisors did. They, they very strongly supported legalization. It's, actually, they were okay with keeping the population undocumented also and not deporting them. His Council of Economic Advisors recognized that there were two social groups in the United States that were huge booms to the U.S. economy. One was undocumented immigrants, and the other were gays and lesbians in the United States, because gays and lesbians had, you know, weren't having children at the rate that, 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 seemed to, that uh, other couples were. And so, and so there, his advisors, it was all about the economy. And so I don't have to tell you that the economic argument for undocumented immigrants to the United States, that case is, is cut and dry. We can rest our, we can rest our case. Uh, it's clear. Everything that you hear from the right about the bad effects of, of undocumented immigrants on the economy is wrong. Uh, and uh, and I, if, 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 if we wanted to go a couple more hours, I can, uh, we can talk about that because um, I, I have read every economic study that's ever been done on immigrants in the United States. And I can tell you that, that it's clear that there's no economic hindrance that immigrants, documented or undocumented, bring to the United States. In fact, they're job creators. So, when it, when it comes to the, the current policies, and, and um, I had a chance to catch up with folks today on what was covered, it's, it, it is very clear that uh, this is a, 
this is an opportunity, this time is an opportunity in part because of what the Republicans were whining about after the November elections, uh, that, that they feel that uh, they may not win another national election if they don't get Latino votes. Um, and that sentiment, I'm, I'm confident, is still within the mindset of many of the Republican Party, and it's also in the mindset of the Democratic Party as well. Uh, both parties have a lot to be ashamed of when it comes to immigration reform or the lack thereof. Uh, the Republicans, for the obvious, because they blocked everything progressive uh, since September 11th, uh, 2001, and, and the Democrats, because they haven't passed anything progressive since September of 2001, and, and on top of that, uh, this Democratic president has record-breaking deportation rates, uh, and you know, so I, I'm not that big, big of a fan of either party when it comes to demanding that they deliver on something for the uh, uh, for the constituents that that I'm familiar with, and DACA notwithstanding. So when when we think about immigration reform. Uh, uh, it, the, the debate will be depicted in the media between uh, those who want more immigration enforcement and, who, and those who, uh, who want legalization for the estimated, whatever, 10 to 12 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. And uh, that, both those issues will get a lot of publicity. The other issue that will get a lot of publicity are proposals, uh, not, not just what kind of legalization, is it with or without a path to citizenship, uh, but, uh, but there will be discussions, of course, uh, with, with respect to the DREAM Act, and there will be discussions, however, with respect to agricultural workers, and then well, that always segues into a discussion on guest workers. And so the threat that President, the second President Bush had, which was very surprising to many of us that he actually couldn't get his Republican Party to go along with, was that as a substitute for legalization, there would be a massive guest worker program that lasted three to six years. And, um, and if the Republican Party had delivered on that uh, when President Bush first announced it in 2003 and continued to talk about it until he, he left office, um, we would be talking differently today about immigration reform, because uh, it, we would be talking about whether or not we would be able to legalize those guest workers that are finishing their six-year stint on temporary visas. So the, one of the challenges to all of us, if this train does continue to move, and it is, uh, 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 you should realize that it's true what we hear, that there are serious people working on legislative language in the White House. There are serious people working on legislative language on, in both parties and in both houses of Congress. It's, it, people are working on it right now. And yes, it's true that there may be some language that is revealed in the next uh, 60 to, to 90 days. Uh, what's disappointing is that there's not much conversation between the White House and other Democrats, uh, but, but the train, however slowly, is moving in spite of the budget debates and in spite of gun control legislation that's necessary. Uh, th there, there is going to be some discussions on immigration reform. And, and again, based on what I've heard in terms of what dreamers are willing to advocate for and what all of us believe in, is that, that uh, the starting point for us is not just the DREAM Act. The starting point for us is about the parents of DREAMers, the cousins and the uncles of DREAMers. The starting point includes, includes uh, statutory fixes that are complicated but, but nonetheless important. For example, what about those parents of ours who have been deported? How do they get back in? Uh, what about individuals who are facing a three and ten year bar, three or ten year bar for being undocumented in the United States and fearing that 
if they leave, they won't be able to get back in, uh, even if they have the basis for a legal immigration visa. What about individuals who have um, been longtime permanent residents or refugees in the United States who made one mistake, made one mistake, and might be categorized as an aggravated felony, as an aggravated felon, and gets deported after living in the United States since living here as an infant. Uh, those types of situations where, where Mexicans in particular are penalized statutorily because many undocumented immigrants have come across the border surreptitiously, but because of a provision in the law that does not allow adjustment of status in the United States unless you entered with an inspection, Mexicans are not eligible for adjustment of status in the United States. They have to leave so that they're forced into the trap of the three and tenure, tenure bar. Why, why isn't there a fix to that that's more permanent? Those, those kinds of things that, that will get discussed and will be put on the table, uh, not to mention things like uh, contesting secure communities, contesting detention policies, that, that will be pushed by allies in the immigrant rights community. But believe me, what will happen, assuming that this train moves uh, continuously, what will happen is that we're going to all be challenged by the compromises that are put on the table. In 2007, when we came, Congress came very close to, to uh, passing a, a, a law that, that contained a legalization provision, I, I confess to you that I opposed it, and I opposed it very strongly and vehemently, even though, even though perhaps five to eight million people might have become legalized. The problem with the 2007 bill was that those individuals who would be legalized wouldn't get a green card for 12 to 15 years. The problem was that the compromise for legalization under that bill was that there would be no more family immigration categories. The problem with those proposals was that nothing would begin until the border was quote unquote sealed. And so when I hear that the border needs to be sealed, I think of Operation Gatekeeper. I think of the militarization of the border that continues to result in unnecessary deaths at the border of our brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles that are trying to come across, not because they want to come here for a vacation. They're coming here because of trade policies that the United States is engaged in. So the challenge that we're going to have, um, uh, that the dreamers may have, is that what if the only thing that's left on the table is the DREAM Act with a lot of negative consequences, if that's the bill that's legis legislated. You will be told, you will be told that you should support that bill. You will be told that something is better than nothing, even though in the process of getting something, you're subtracting a lot more than just the numbers that you're gonna benefit from in terms of dreamers. And, and I'm not about to tell you that support, if that is what occurs at the end of the day, that, that, you sh that you shouldn't support it. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you that. It, it's, it's, uh, as I was saying in a different context a little while ago, you, you, you're, you're grown-ups. You, you make those decisions. And you will be told, don't worry if there's a legalization provision that it's going to take 10 years for somebody to get a green card uh, or that there's not a path to citizenship or that it's a guest worker program. You will be told, don't worry. We'll take that up again in a few years and remedy all that. And, you know, for somebody who's been waiting for another legalization program since 1986, I can tell you, it's a, it's a long wait. And, and I'm not so sure that, um, um, that it's worth the price. So, which brings us to, to what your duties and the responsibilities and opportunities are. You, dreamers, as you know, taught us a whole new chapter when it comes to political science. Uh, we were always told that members of Congress, the White House would not listen to anyone uh, unless 
it was about voters, and yeah, okay, maybe it got translated that way. But but the people that were that finally ultimately got DACA uh, were the dreamers through their actions, and um, it's it, it wasn't a coincidence. Of course, you've read this that uh, that that DACA was announced within a couple of weeks of of deferred action of. Uh, dreamers sitting in at President Obama's campaign offices in Colorado and other places. But I'll tell you, the bigger coincidence, uh, and perhaps the bigger uh, key, was that, uh, was that the dreamers began speaking with Marco Rubio. Uh, because it was very clear, and in a not very well publicized interview with Daniel Axelrod, one of uh, Obama's chief advisors, he let it slip. That, uh, that in fact, as soon as Rubio began talking to the dreamers, that's when he walked into the president's office and said, we better damn well do something for those dreamers. Otherwise, Rubio's gonna claim the credit. So, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you've taught us that. Uh, you've taught us uh, that, that you talk to everyone. You just, you don't just talk to natural allies. You've taught us that, uh, that, that you can, that any one of us can make a difference and it's stupid of us to sit back. The other thing that I, uh, that, that I, I criticize many of my allies in the immigrant rights community, some incidentally have taken credit for DAP DACA, okay? Uh, that, for example, in the, in the famous marches of May Day 2006, when, when the streets were, uh, and, uh, one of my favorite gifts, you might have even been in the audience, uh, uh, Jose Arriola. Uh, I, I, I spoke at Santa Clara University a few years ago. One of my favorite gifts for speaking is a photograph of, of San Jose and the streets that were all taken over by the people that were marching in San Jose. They, they, they closed down the goddamn freeway uh, because of, yep. of that march. Uh, and, and that's San Jose, New York, uh, Chicago, uh, places around the country, a similar kind of thing. And, and what irritated me was my allies in the immigrant rights community claiming credit for bringing those people out, when in truth, it, it, was, uh, it was radio hosts, it was people on the ground, it had nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with the friends, the people I still consider my friends who want to credit for that. But, um, so the other thing that I've heard recently is that, uh, that many of our friends in D.C. primarily have gone, all, gone after millions and millions of dollars uh, to push through immigration reform. And, and uh, it, it, it's, we, we, it, it, it puts us in an awkward position when our allies are so quick to compromise that not only do we have to lobby Republicans and Democrats in the White House, we also have to lobby our allies. We have to make sure that they understand, don't forget our parents, or don't forget the longtime permanent residents who made one mistake. Uh, don't forget about secure communities. It, it's, it's, we put, we're put in that position. But that's what we all have to do if we really want to make a difference, is each and every one of us uh, pick up our cell phones, call those folks, pick up our cell phones uh, and call the White House line, pick up our cell phones, talk to the new Republican member of the House Subcommittee on Immigration, Sky Labrador. Um, th that's what we have to do. Write them and tell them that we're here and don't let them forget it. Because, you know, we, we are a nation of immigrants, but we have always been a nation that debates, that debates immigration policy. And while this dreamy notion of being a nation of immigrants, we hear it from our public leaders. We're not so stupid to, that we don't understand that really uh, there's a huge segment of the population that is stuck in this Eurocentric vision of what an American is. And so when it comes to a land of immigrants, they ain't looking at many of us in the audience, okay? Uh, they're looking elsewhere for who makes an American. But what they are only now beginning to realize is that that, uh, that it's inevitable, that demographic changes are not going to stop. 
And that at some point, and you know, I think within my lifetime, and you can calculate how old I am based on what I told you when I was a freshman, um, I, I, in my lifetime, there will be comprehensive immigration reform that we will be happy with, actually. And it's because of the democratic threat that we pose to those political leaders that we have. And I will be alive when that happens. Thank you. Woo!